Hey everybody, it's Ricky again, Sunday afternoon. I'm back here in my kitchen. Uh, I really enjoyed worshiping with y'all today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I, uh, man, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be in there. And we got about, I don't know, about eight people in there, you know. The, uh, I got my wife and the musicians and the, uh, the sound uh, guys, Tim and Dustin. But it's just not the same. It's not the same without y'all. And so I really do miss you. So this is uh, Sunday evening's uh, Frequently Asked Questions. It's just a way to stay in touch. Stephanie, thank you for tuning in. You're first, so you get to write first in the comments line if you want to. Deanne Harris, thank you for turning, tuning in. I sure do miss you. It'd be hard to see you, though. Honestly, if I saw you, I'd want to give you a great big hug, and then, you know, I'd probably get shot or put in prison. Uh, <laughs> oops, sorry about that. I didn't make, mean to make the camera shake. So, hope y'all are doing well. Uh, before I jump into questions, I want to just kind of clean a couple things up from this morning. Let me go grab my Bible real quick. Sorry. All right, I'm back. Hey, Jessica Prysock. Been a long time since I've seen you. Thanks for checking in with us. Hope you're doing well. I, uh... Gotta confess, I'm having trouble calling up your, your boy's name. He's the same age as my boy. I remember remember them being Will, Will Price How is how is Will doing? I hope he's doing well. Our Will is in the uh in the Air Force now, which is crazy. It's crazy. So I think Will was I guess Will was more Brundage in, in Harold's age though. So I guess he would be he would be a little bit older than that. Alright, anyway, I wanted to clean a couple things up. Uh, before I jumped into your questions this afternoon. And one of the things, I, I just I didn't have time. I don't have time to bring everything out during a Sunday sermon, uh, but I wanted to bring a couple things out. One is I, 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 I asserted that uh, Thomas was kind of the audience, right? And we were supposed to identify with him. And this is the reason why I said that. Uh, you know, you have this whole story about Thomas being confronted with the resurrected Jesus. And what does he do? He says... He believes. He said, my Lord and my God. Jesus says, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. And then immediately John goes on to say, uh, these things are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing in him you may have life. See how John uh, Thomas was the, 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 the archetype, the, the, the great example of what John wants all of his readers to do, to examine and to say, my Lord and my God, and then, uh, and then to believe and to, to find life in believing. So that was one of the things I wanted to clean up from this morning. Uh, Bianca, can you think of anything else I need to clean up? Or kind of give, no, you weren't expecting that question. That's not fair. Uh, I have my notes right here. Uh, if you see any questions in your notes, let me know. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Mason Heidelberg, oh my gosh, that is amazing. It's great to see you. I have a question. You said, my Lord and my God, when Thomas said that, was the first time that someone had identified him as God. Yeah. Is that? That is right. The, the, the first time in the narrative, no one in the narrative. I mean, John obviously starts, Bianca's question was, hey, Emily Llewellyn, my kindergarten teacher is here, y'all. Isn't that amazing? Living in a small town is a precious thing. And no, I didn't get a haircut, Caroline, I guess. I just ran my fingers through my hair so much that the gel wore off. Uh, hey, Mike. Bianca was asking me about my comment that when Thomas says, my Lord and my God, the first, that's the first time that Jesus is referred to as God. And it is the, the, the specific word theos um, in the narrative of John. Now, John clearly identifies him as God in the very first chapter, right? He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. So G John is declaring him as God in the very first verses. And then he gives us this full arc of a narrative that ends with Thomas saying, yes, this is God, Jesus, this person that I've walked with and I've lived with and I've experienced life with for four years and now I see him resurrected from the dead. He's God. And, so, and, then, and then John summarizes with that little passage there where he says, um, John Lynch is here. Oh my goodness. Sorry, got to stop for John Lynch. Good to see you, brother. And then uh, John, 
comments with that little phrase, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. You see how the whole purpose of his book was to get you back to verse 1 so that you would believe what he, what he asserts in verse 1, that just Jesus is the Son of God. And, and then Thomas, when he makes this grand statement of faith, he is kind of the, he is the audience. He is the ideal audience that John wants to have in the story. Hey, Lauren Houston, hope you got that gift my wife sewed for you. It's good to, good to see you. Hey, Kimberly Mayo. And, uh, oh my goodness, John just said he trusted me. That was a scary word. Joanna Craddock Burns, good to see you. Thank you for coming. So anyway, those are the few things I wanted to uh, kind of tie up from this morning. The rest of the time is yours. I want to answer your questions. I got, I got three or four to kind of prime the pump. And uh, Lauren says, yes, honey, she can't wait to use it. Lauren, you're going to love that towel because all the other baby towels that they sell you are useless. They're like, they don't absorb any water. And that towel will keep your baby so warm, you're going to love it. Man, this is just so erratic. And I want you to know, like, you're getting an insight into Ricky's brain. Uh, this, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm always doing that. So, uh, all right, Stephanie, let's get to your question. All right, Stephanie Hankins says, I'm reading Heaven by Randy Alcorn. I have not read that book. I love his book on the treasure principle. I uh, really respect that. I've not seen this one. I've got lots of questions. How will rewards work in heaven? Oh, Stephanie, that is just not a very American question, honey. No. We, we, look, everybody's going to be terribly happy. Everybody, when we're in heaven, Jesus is going to be smiling at you. And you're not going to have a shred of jealousy or competitiveness. Uh, you won't have a shred of sin, no covetousness at all. And so it's hard for you to imagine things like rewards and some people getting more and some people getting less because we can't, we're so just, I mean, for me, jealousy and competition, it's so much in my heart that I can't even stand to think about other people without sinning. So, so just try to imagine a world where you know no jealousy where you never compare yourself to anyone else. Okay. In that world, Jesus says some people you know, will receive greater rewards and some people will receive lesser. And he actually encourages us to live in such a way that we will get the greater rewards. Now, how can you be greater than heaven? Well, I think the, 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 best, the best thinkers and the best you know, spiritual leaders in the world have, have, have explained it in such a way to basically say this, you get more of Jesus. You just get, you get, you get to be closer to him. Uh, that's the way George Whitfield described it. You get to be closer to him. Um, I actually kind of go with a, a reverse kind of way of thinking in the sense that I think more of you is going to be there. All right, so let me give you an illustration. I'm talking about heaven. All right, right now, sun's shining right here. Right out of that window. See, I'm looking into the sun. I can't stand to look at it. It's so bright. The reason why I can't look into the sun is because I'm not very strong. My eyes are too weak to look into the sun. If I were stronger, I'd be able to look straight into it. But I'm weak. My eyes are weak, and so I have to almost close them, right? I think... This, that my understanding of the New Testament, of Jesus' teachings, is that those who develop their spiritual, their faith, you're becoming more and more real. You're becoming more and more substantive. Spirit, your soul is growing and becoming more and more substantive. So that on that day, that day of the resurrection, that's connected to this day, you will be able to look more straight, if that makes sense, into the face of God. He's going to be brighter than the sun. And you'll actually be able to look at him because you've developed your spiritual muscle. You've developed your strength. That's, that's what I think that means, Stephanie. I'm not sure. It's, it is confusing, but it is uh, taught in the Bible. I, uh, I taught a little bit on it 
I don't know, six months ago or so, but last year, last year, I think I was teaching out of Luke, maybe. Uh, it is, it is, it's a hard teaching. I, but I trust Randy Alcorn, so uh, I would go with him, whatever he says. A lot of people have joined us. Nancy Armour Appling, good to see you. Kelly Hand, it's been a long time, brother. I guess, you're, I think you were in Phoenix last time we, we talked. I don't remember. Maria DeLay, good to see you. Vicki Jones, everybody. Vicki Jones is my cousin. Uh, from West Tennessee that I've not seen in a very long time. Good to see you. Evie Houston, Stephanie Hankins, you're welcome. All right, if you have other questions, let me know. i got a couple of text questions. Let me cheat real quick, okay? I'm going to cheat real quick. i got a great question from sweet um, Mallory Dalton Mitchell. Hey, it's Evie. i got a, I got a question from Mallory Dalton Mitchell asking me about Christians engaging in politics. Now, if you know me at all, you know I am chomping at the bit to answer that question. But I'm not going to, and I'll tell you why. We have all been cooped, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but we have all been cooped up for six weeks. And we are all edgy, hey, Bill Boy? We are all touchy. We are all just... We're angry. We're angry at the COVID virus. We're angry at COVID-19 for taking away graduation and taking away spring and taking away Easter, taking away all the things that we wanted to celebrate together. It's, it's robbed those things from us. And we're angry. And we can't do a thing about it. And that feeling of helplessness, hey, Shannon Stitt, that feeling of helplessness generates so much anxiety in our hearts that uh, we are just looking for something to be mad at. It actually makes us feel better to be mad. To just, even though you don't know it, your soul is crying out right now, give me something to be mad about. I would feel better. <laughs> and I ain't going to do it. <laughs> I ain't stepping into that trap. So I am not going to talk about Christians in politics in 2020 of March, in March of 2020. That would just be suicide. So I'm not going to do it. I, I got a lot of opinions. I would, I'm going to send you out to read other people. I, I personally love the writings of David French. He writes for a daily mag, uh, news magazine, an e-magazine called The... Uh, called The Dispatch. His articles are called The French Press. I love David. He's a PCA. He used to be a PCA elder. He's changed churches. He's a Christian. He loves the Lord dearly. His Easter, his Easter uh, newsletter was just amazing last week. His newsletter today was great. In it, he addresses uh, Al Mohler's video that he put out. I, I'm going to recommend him to you. I'm going to recommend, hey, Paul Schroeder, thank you for coming. Joe, good to see you. Um, I'm going to recommend him to you and uh, and if you want to talk to me personally about uh, Christians and politics, I'd be glad to do that. But I'm not stepping onto that in Facebook. That's just, that's a landmine. That's a, that's a race car in the red, honey. That's, that's ready to go off. So would you agree with my decision to not talk about that? Bianca's giving me a huge nod. Whenever Bianca nods at me, I know I'm doing the right thing. So, yeah. Not going to do it. I'm, I'm stopping right there. So Mallory, I'm going to email you back uh, and with some links, and that's going to be all you get today. So when in the fall, after everything's back to normal and everybody's feeling good and happy again, we'll jump into that topic. All right, if you have questions, type them in. If you don't, I'm going to answer a few that I got today. Uh, sweet Isabel Bicegel wrote and said... Um, how does not getting our safety from God affect us negatively? How can we combat it? I struggle with security and safety also. Hey, Susanna Downing, I miss you. Hope you're doing well. Bianca sends out her love as well. Let's talk a little bit about spirituality, kind of Christian-y talk, can we? What does it mean to get our safety from God? I trust the Lord. My, my soul and my life is in His hands. I, I actually, I know sometimes y'all don't think that I'm as Calvinistic as you are, but I promise you, I have been a Calvinist 
since 1989. It's deep inside my DNA by now. I, I really do believe with all my soul that my life is in God's hands and not a single hair can fall from my head without God's loving care, without his permission. I, I believe that. I 100% believe it. I, I believe that I am immortal. I am impenetrable until God says that something can penetrate me. I, I believe with all my heart. I really do. You know what else? I buckle my seatbelt. And I go to the doctor every year to get my heart checked because I got bad genes. And I take four prescriptions a day. Um, does that all that mean that I'm not getting my safety from God? No. I, I'm getting my safety from God. I trust the Lord in my body. And he is giving me this, these things. And I'm using them. What does that mean? Well, right now we live in a state that's, that's a little bit scary. Um, we live in a time when, when there's a pandemic and when, um, when we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And that's a scary feeling and it makes us anxious. Hey, Tammy, I love you too. And, um, these things are all hard. And, and I say all that to say this. Please, I'm going to look straight into the camera, okay? Please don't beat yourself up for feeling anxious or being a little bit scared right now. We all are. That feeling of fear that you're feeling, that's something that God created so that you would be safe to keep you alive and to take care of you. You are not acting out of faithlessness if you're a little bit scared right now. Don't beat yourself up for that. That's, that's foolishness. It's okay to be wise and to take care of yourself. Now, you know, do, is there a place where anxiety and worry become sinful? Yeah, you, you can become sinful if you, if you don't, you know, if you can't trust anything that you can't control. But some, for some of us, that's hard. Uh, I made reference to this this morning, and I'll, I'll say more about it now. I, uh... I had a counselor tell me this last two weeks ago. He said, we were talking about just how I, I, I sinfully dominated my kids quite a bit when they were little and, and, and had some anxiety issues and control issues. And he said this, he said, you're the son of an addict and every son of an addict I've ever known has control issues because you only felt security when you were in control blown away. I was like, wow, you just gave me deep, deep penetrating insight into my own heart. That was fascinating. And so, yeah, I, I, I struggle with anxiety more than the average person. It's, it's harder for me to just trust that everything's going to be okay. Uh, that's all right. The Lord's gracious and kind. Uh, the more I'm able to trust him, the happier I am. The more I'm able to trust him, the more peace I have. But that doesn't make me less of a Christian that I struggle with anxiety. I hope that makes sense. So I don't want, I just, I just my, my main concern for, for you, uh, for those of you who struggle with fear and anxiety is that you beat yourself up for it. We live in an anxious time right now. Anybody who tells you they're not dealing with any anxiety right now is just a liar and someone who cannot be trusted. Everybody's anxious right now. That's okay. All right? God's going to walk us through it. We're going to walk each other through it. We're going to embrace each other. We're gonna, that's, that's why I get on Facebook three times a week. I'm just trying to put my virtual arms around your shoulders and say, sisters, honey, brothers, we're going to be okay. We're going to walk through this together. Okay? Nobody's going anywhere. And you're not a bad person if you're afraid right now. That is, that is okay. So anyway, I hope that I hope that was helpful. Uh, Boyd, you ask a long question. Uh, do we have plans related to the church? Governors talk about churches meeting somehow May third, if numbers allow. Uh, we have a team putting something together. Okay, so uh, I don't know if y'all heard that, but the governors is 
basically there's a plan that maybe, maybe, fingers crossed, we can start gathering again uh, in May. And I hope that happens. Uh, I have go, uh, we have a team. Uh, I'm not going to give you any names because I don't want them to get overwhelmed with emails. But they're already starting to work things out. And we're talking about all kinds of, everything's on the, on the table right now. If we need to go to three or four worship services, I'll preach all day long if I get to see my friends. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're planning something. They're planning something, boy. And I, boy, I hope that's true. Don't get my hopes up. Don't get my hopes up. Rachel Joy Welcher is here. Y'all, she's a sweet girl. I miss her. She, uh, she came to a church, our church at an important time in her life, and it was a good friend. Emily Perkins, I got a sweet, sweet note from your husband today. Glad you glad you've checked in with us. Andy Moresman, it's always good to hear from you. Trisha McBride, miss you. Hope you and your husband are doing well there in Alabama. I guess you're in Alabama. Are you in Alabama or Mississippi? I don't remember anymore. All right, more questions. I got a couple more texted in here. Some of these are a little more technical than you may have wanted. But um Again, how do we resist the, question, the, the, the urge to be overly cautious or fearful in this environment, at the same time taking all the possible health measures? I think, um, I think that's, you know, I, I tried to answer it. Do everything you can to stay safe. Uh, do everything you can to stay safe. Andy Morrisman, that's a great question. I'm going to come back to that one. I love that stuff. How do we address and cope with the, uh, this is again, another question about just kind of living in the age of the coronavirus. Hey, Carrie Green, been a long time. I remember you coming over and visiting my mom. Those are sweet memories. Good to see you, said brother. Uh, all right, back to the question. How do we address and cope with the shaming by some as we start to phase in certain social activities again? Look, this is the deal. I was talking to my son today. His friend group had a huge explosion. They were all saying really, really mean things to each other. And I told him, I said, look, everybody's edgy right now. Everybody's touchy. And everybody's saying things that they're going to wish they could have back. Shaming is part of that. Uh, some of us are just tired of being cooped up. And we're going to start I mean, the second that door is cracked open, when we could go out, we're going to sprint out that door. <laughs> I'm sprinting out that door, I'm telling you right now. And I'm going to make some of you uncomfortable. Some of you are more careful and more patient, and you're maybe a little bit more scared, I don't know. Maybe probably in your own wisdom, you're more scared, and you're going to stay back. And you're going to want to justify. Maybe you're not going to let your children come to church. Um, maybe you're not going to come to church. And you're going to feel, you're going to feel a pinch of guilt over that. And you're going to want to uh, justify yourself by shaming somebody else. And all I can say to you is this, take a deep profound drink of God's grace and believe that you're okay. Your decisions, you don't have to justify your decisions to anybody in the world. If you want to keep your children home with you forever, that is your decision. That's okay. If you want to, um, if you want to push your kids out there and hope they get the virus so that they can, uh, so that they can, uh, you know, get immune faster. That's your decision. And you don't need anybody else to justify you. You're right with God, and you're going to do your best to be wise with all your friends, and you're going to embrace them, and you're going to do the, the best you can, okay? And you can't let anybody else make you feel guilty for you, okay? And this is the main thing, all right? Some of you feel guilty all the time and you're just looking for an excuse. And so, if you don't do what I do, you're going to want to blame me and be like, well, you're trying to shame me. I'm not trying to shame you. You, you carry shame around with you in your heart, sweetheart. 
Nobody has ashamed you. You're condemning yourself. That's between you and Jesus. And others of us, we've taken, we've drunk. I mean, man, if you're just looking, if you want to condemn me, you got a million things to condemn me for. And I, I, I really try to take a deep drink of Jesus every day. And so it's a little bit harder to make me feel guilty. It doesn't make me more righteous. It's just harder to make me feel guilty because I got so much to feel guilty for that Jesus just rescued me from it. And so, you know, that it all, we just have to all make our own decisions and feel like the responsible, God loving adults that we are and not depend upon how, what other people, whether other people agree with this or not, uh, to justify what we're doing. I hope that makes sense to you. Because uh, this is going to become a really, really big deal. And, you know, I've seen people, you know, putting things on Facebook and, 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 you know, I, all the other neighborhood kids in my neighborhood were out playing, but I kept my kids inside. Did I do the right thing? And, and we're all looking for other people to justify us saying, you did the right thing. And sometimes you're going to get it and sometimes you won't. And this is the truth. And I want you to hear this as uncomfortable as it sounds. Nobody knows what the right thing is. Nobody. We've never been here before. Maybe Sweden's doing the right thing and just kind of ignoring it and letting people get sick. Maybe, maybe America's doing the right thing. Maybe South Korea. Nobody knows. Nobody knows if we should take our kids out of the house or keep them in the house. We don't know. And so we're all going to have to live by faith. And most importantly, we're all going to have to give grace to other people and say, man, I don't know. Maybe they did the right thing. And I'm just going to withhold my judgment. It's not my job to go around and tell everybody, you do the right thing. You are bad. Good. Bad. That's not my job. I'm just trying to do my right thing. So we're all going to just struggle through this together. Okay, I hope, I hope that made sense. I got behind on my comments here. Let me see where I am. Andy Moore's been asking me a hard question. I'm going to jump on that. Did Jesus always know what was going to happen to him or was it revealed to him by through his life? It's a great question, Brandon Penner. I'm going to follow, this one, follow up on this one. Thinking about how the human and God... Act. Yes, this is important. Jesus sometimes knew what was about to happen to him because he had read the Bible. This is very important to understand this, okay? Jesus um, never cheated. He never relied on the fact that he was God to make his life easier. He only used his divinity to make other people's lives better. He fed thousands. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. But when he was hungry, he was just hungry. When he was hurting, he hurt and he suffered. And he himself died. He, and he waited upon the Holy Spirit, on God, on the God the Father to raise him up. He never used his divinity for himself. That's, the, that, that's very important that you understand that. And so, yes, sometimes he knew what was going to happen to him, but it was always because he spent so much time reading the prophecies and reading the Psalms so that he, he knew how he was going to die from reading Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. But he did not. Uh, he did not cheat. If, if that makes sense to you, Brandon, that's a good question. It's an important question um, for those theologues out there, who budding theologians who want to know more about the deity and the humanity of Christ and how those things intersect. Whenever uh, Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, hasn't that always been an interesting phase to you? What, how can you tempt Jesus? He kept saying things like, "Throw yourself off the mountaintop or the pinnacle of the temple." Or, or feed yourself. What was he doing? He was saying, cheat. Use your divinity to cheat. To make your life easier. And Jesus said, no. I'm going to trust God and live by his word. And then when Jesus was on the cross, what was the voice in his ears? What were they saying? They were saying, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Why would you suffer? They're saying, cheat. Use your divinity for yourself. He never did. He never did. He lived as a man. He died like a man so that we could live forever like God. 
That was very important. And um, if he had, well, I don't want to say what would happen if he had cheated because he, he didn't. So that's very important. Great question, Brandon. Let me jump back up here to jo uh, Andy Morsman's question. Andy Morsman asks, why did Jesus tell Mary Magdalene not to touch him because he had not yet ascended to the Father, but told Thomas to touch his wounds? Uh, <laughs> honestly, it seemed, what it seems like, seems, is that Jesus hadn't been to see the Father at all yet. Um, I don't know how time works. God was, you know, Jesus was zapping in and out. Uh, from one dimension to the to the next, uh, he was stepping back and forth between heaven. Some want to say, you know, John talks about the door being locked and Jesus appearing between them, and they want to say, "See, he could walk through a locked door." That doesn't make any sense because he didn't have to cover tight space. I think it's wiser. I think it's more closer to the truth to think in in the heavenly dimension. Heaven is not a place, it's a dimension that's right here among us. We just can't see it. And he was stepping back and forth between heaven and earth. Um, Andy, I don't know. That, that, that passage has always just absolutely thrilled me. When Jesus says to Mary, don't cling to me, I've not yet gone to the Father. I mean, I, I, think, I think he went back and forth between the Father and the disciples it really sounds like he just hadn't been there yet. Like he stopped to see Mary before he even went to the Father. I don't know. That's such sacred passage. I mean, it's hard to speculate about it, but it it certainly seems that way, doesn't it? It seems like he just loved Mary so much and he wanted to comfort her so badly that even though he was on his way to the Father, he turned around and came back. That's what it seems like. I don't know. I can't say that with with absolute, you know, biblical background but it sure seems that way doesn't it and what a precious just incredibly precious thing that would be i got a sermon i used to preach called there's something about mary i need to dig that one out again preach it again what do the bible what do we do with the bible passages that appear to say things about women or slaves that make us feel uncomfortable how do we respond when non-believers ask us about these passages those are two good questions the first question is Whenever we're talking about, there are things in the Bible about slaves that make me very uncomfortable. I agree with that. And I try to understand them as best I can in that context. Um, but one thing is very important to understand is this. Slavery as it was practiced in the United States of America in the 19th century and 18th century and some, to some degree in the 17th, was not biblical at all. It was based on man stealing, kidnapping, purchasing of, of humans. It involved rape and all kinds of just terrible things that were not biblical at all. So anybody who tried to use the Bible to justify the evil practices in the United States in that era, they were way off base. They were way off base. Now, Slavery in the Bible was different. It was very different. Uh, it was even different, you know, in different t periods of the Bible. Like in, um, in Deuteronomy, it was really the slaves were people, con conquered people who chose to, to become a slave rather than to be basically killed in battle. Um, by the time Jesus came along in the New Testament, Slaves were basically uh, poor people, poorer people, almost middle class, honestly. Like lawyers were slaves. And uh, that, that only way that you could kind of afford to get along in Roman culture, if you weren't landed, if you didn't have land, if you weren't a Roman citizen, was by selling yourself to someone as a slave and they would take care of you. It's very different. It's, hard. it's important to understand the cultural context of it. Now, uh, and so we, we try to figure that out, and, and the Bible is always uh, striving to, to bring equality to people and dignity to people, and, and the overall laws, the, there's, there's, there's over laws and under laws. The over laws are the moral laws. The moral laws interpret and define all the specific uh, kind of cultural civil laws underneath them, and the overall moral, the overall, overall, like the, <laughs> okay. 
So you have like the civil laws. What do you do when an ox goads somebody or, you know, put a turret on the edge of your house? And then you have over that explaining those really is the Ten Commandments. And over that, you have the, the one big commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, stroll, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in a culture where there is a, such a thing as money and public education and work for everybody who wants it, it's hard for us to believe how anybody could be a slave and be loved. Just know that economically, things weren't always that way. And all, there are several laws in the Bible, actually, that are assuming the worst about humanity. And they're saying, you're going to do wrong things. Let me at least regulate those things. And they're kind of pushing us. The gospel is pushing us to a better world. And to many degrees, we live in that better world today. Now, more importantly, let's look at the second part of your question, Paul. How do we respond when non-believers ask us about these passages? And the way I respond to them is I, I ask them, what do they believe about the resurrected Jesus? What do you believe about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You have to deal with him first. You can't deal with him first. Is he your master and your God? If he's not, then none of those other things matter. You're going to reject them all anyway. If he is, and you've seen his goodness, you've seen his grace, you've seen that God himself is so loving and so kind that he would willingly be tortured to be with me, then we can begin to try to understand and interpret those laws in a way that understands how kind and good God is. But, but you know, when, when Jesus was at the, the well talking with this, this woman uh, in John chapter 4, who was terribly sexually immoral, he didn't start off talking to her about her sexual immorality. He didn't start off talking to her about her adultery. He started off talking to her about himself. And if someone's not a disciple, a follower of Jesus, I'm not going to talk to you about all the other stuff. I mean, that's, that's family intramural squabbling. And yeah, we got to struggle to figure it out. Um, and I I'll, I'll put this, I'll tell you this, I'll put Christianity in the, in the ring with every other form of religion, ancient or modern, and say, we've treated women better than any other religion. You, you want to compare how the Hindu religion has treated women? Let's go talk. Um, but that's, that's not where we're going to start. We're going to start with Jesus. What is, what is Jesus? Who do you think Jesus is? That's where we're going to begin. So that's, those are my answers to those questions, Jordan. Jimmy Rocket. Guys, Jimmy Rocket sat next to me in seventh grade. He's a good friend. And, uh, Jimmy, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but he, Jimmy made a profession of faith the Sunday after my brother's funeral. And I've never, ever forgotten that. It always made me so happy, the thought that someone may have professed Christ at my brother's funeral. That made me, it's a dear, dear memory to me, Jimmy. I've never told you that. But I uh, hope you're doing well, brother. Katie, haven't seen you in a long time. Hope you're doing well. Want nothing for the best for you, but the best for you. Jordan, uh, Missy, good to see you. Rebecca, it's always good to see you, Red. John Moss, hope you're doing well. Guys, that is all the questions I have for today. So uh, it's been about 30 minutes. But it's been 40 minutes. Good heavens. My voice is uh, parched and my throat is dry. So let's take the day off. I love y'all. I miss you so much. I am a guy who's... Uh, my love language is hugging. I'm not going to lie to you. And I long for the day when I can hug you uh, again. I miss hugging you. Nadine, so glad you popped in here at the very last second. Hope you're doing well. Uh, let's see. Oh, I, for some reason, my thing re reached, but went back in time. Okay, love you. Nadine, love you dearly. Bye, y'all. Hope this has been a good time. Hope you enjoyed it. This is one of my favorite things to do. And uh, I'm ready to start the week now. Lord bless you. I'll miss y'all. Y'all have a good day. <laughs>